What's the main takeaway from my recent interactions with apologist Sean McDowell? Now, apology is right. Apology is right. Now, apology is right. Apology is right. Now, apology is right. I mean, if you say so. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. His videos are remarkably skillfully put together. Paul G is an excellent YouTuber, and they're entertaining, and they're thoughtful, and they're fun. If you're new to the channel, make sure you push the subscribe button so you can get all the new videos that we release. Why, thank you, Dr. Sean McDowell. What a great way to kick off our time together today. Sean is a professor of theology at Biola University, a speaker, author, and YouTube creator, and most importantly today a researcher on the martyrdom of the Apostles of Jesus. With his more credentialed background in history, I'll let Sean explain how we got here. Well, a couple years ago, I did a full year curriculum with Awana for high school students, and one of the videos was popularizing the death of the Apostles. Posted on my YouTube channel not long ago, a popular YouTuber by the name of Paul Gia made a video responding to my argument that the deaths of the Apostles is good evidence for the resurrection. When I saw Paul Gia's video, I thought, you know what? We obviously differ, but he's taking my ideas seriously. He's engaging the conversation. Uh, here's somebody who's trying to put forth a counter proposal. This is how we figure things out. So I did a video response and then you invited us on. <laughs> and somehow I suddenly found myself on the popular British debate program, Unbelievable. I saw some of the back and forth and thought, hey, why don't we get these guys on Unbelievable and, and have it out <laughs> on air. And after that conversation aired, Sean did a few post-debate stops on capturing Christianity. I listened to your discussion between uh, between yourself and Apologia, and I always screw up how to pronounce his his name. And on Frank Turek's cross-examined show, and you were debating uh, a YouTuber by the name of Paul Enns, I think his name is, and I was on this very topic, the martyrdom of the apostles. So, if my math is correct, including our chat. Sean has participated in almost four and a half hours of content on this topic since my last video. That's a lot. Obviously, we'll, we'll end up just covering just some of the ground, not all of it. I'm going to do my best to condense things here and address the main points as efficiently as possible. I'd encourage you to find the original videos linked in the description for full context. But even so, I feel like we have a bit of a journey ahead of us. So thank you in advance for taking it with me. First, we'll go through the general argument, Sean's main objective and my main objective, and then we'll talk about some of the more heated, more contested, more talked about points of controversy and disagreement that came out of this discussion. But first, Sean started each video with some kind words about me, and I'd like to do the same to reciprocate. Beyond his likable demeanor, his clear communication style, his taste in pop culture, and his ever-increasing proclivity at YouTube, I'm most impressed with Sean's generosity as an interlocutor and commitment to intellectual honesty, even when it means standing in opposition to those on his own side. While I've enjoyed my recent opportunities for live discussions with well-known Christians, the format remains outside my comfort zone, in part because interacting with humans isn't my strength, in part because I don't have much practice at it, and in part because of my perfectionist tendencies. So you can imagine my mortification when late in the discussion, in a distracted moment, my brain muddled some of the details about the different Jameses of the New Testament. Okay, let me jump in here. We've conflated three James. Oh, did I? Did okay. I, my, I sorry. As someone who values accuracy, this was a definite low point for me. But I came away feeling my command of the material, including navigating the different Jameses, had been adequately demonstrated in both my existing video catalog and in the hour of discussion we'd had prior to that momentary lapse. But if you've heard some Christians tell the tale, you'd think that moment not only defined the entire discussion, but the entirety of my credibility as well. Even Frank Turek wanted to pounce on it. And he didn't seem to recognize there were three Jameses, so... <laughs> I'm not even aware that there were three Jameses, Frank. Really? And how did Sean respond? Well, there's at least five people in the New Testament referred right. to as James. And one, th this gets to one of the difficulties in my research is you actually see Paul, he got confused for a moment, which happens. The early church fathers got confused. Sure. Very gracious. It's an embarrassing slip on my part, but it happened. That said, 
I didn't see any skeptics questioning Sean's knowledge or credentials when a few minutes later this happened. Most scholars will concede that that's a straightforward execution account because when you read the account of uh, my mind just went blank, who was martyred in uh, Acts six through nine? Holy cow, my mind went blank. Not one of the twelves. Stephen. Thank you, <laughs> Stephen. Yeah. My goodness. Nor did Frank go out of his way to scold himself when moments later he made the same mistake I did. Uh, of the twelve. We yeah. have good evidence for Peter. We have good evidence for James, the brother of Jesus. And we have good evidence for James, uh, the brother of uh, John. Zebedee. Oops, Frank. James, the brother of Jesus, wasn't one of the 12. Something I'm confident you're actually aware of, despite the slip. Then in the middle of our discussion, Justin actually asked Paul to sum up my book, which would be hard to sum up anybody else's book. And he did a pretty good job, enough to show me, wow, he's really read it. He's taking the issue seriously. So I have at least some grasp of the material. Sean also went on to defend me against this accusation. Would you say that he's kind of like cherry picking his sources? Um, you know what? The reality is we are all tempted to do this. And I catch myself doing that at times. And refuse to pile on an assertion that my methodology starts with a conclusion and works backwards. So it's almost like he's he's going from stage two back to stage one, but that's the opposite way of doing this. To be honest with you, I, I would have to give some more thought and probably watch more of his stuff to really understand his larger methodology, how he gets there. I don't know if I can fully comment on that, given that I've really only interacted with his stuff on the Apostles. And he wasn't just coming to my defense personally. Sean was willing to remain intellectually honest for its own sake even when it meant pushing back on ideas put forth by the Christian hosts. And so he basically argues that we should accept what others tell us they've done or perceived unless we have good counter evidence. So woe is me to ever disagree with Richard Swinburne, but I, I might see this one a little bit differently. When it comes to history, the person who makes the claim on any side bears a burden of proof to see if we should trust this testimony or not. It seemed to indicate that Luke is writing Acts by 62 AD, no later than that. I, I just, historically speaking, was not sure how much I could get out of that argument. Sure. All this to say, I found Sean to be one of the more honest Christian apologists that I've come across, both personally and intellectually. But you're not here for pleasantries. We're here to look at the question. Are martyred apostles good evidence for the resurrection? That's our question on today's show. Would the disciples of Jesus have been willing to suffer and die for something they knew to be false? As some of you know, I was a Christian for decades. But about five years ago, I found myself doubting and questioning the contents of the Bible and attempting to see if I could reconstruct my Christian faith using outside sources. They always seem to want to get stuff outside the Bible, as if the Bible documents can't in any way be trusted for any reliable information. Yeah, I think this is actually hard for Christians and for non-Christians, but because mm -hmm. we all have this perspective that's like, it's all or it's none. Right. Either the Bible is 100% inspired and there's no mm -hmm. errors, or it's a worthless historical document. As he says, neither extreme works for a careful examination of history. I can forgive Sean for not knowing my full historical methodology when he sees me labeling some claims as, for the Bible tells me so. We have to look at the Bible as a historical source. I mean, if I just accepted the Bible as a historical source, then I'd just swallow completely the resurrection story as is. And this whole conversation about martyrs would be a waste of time. No. We have to look at the Bible as 66 individual books, each of which may well have had other sources behind them as well. And like any book, it's entirely possible for one sentence to be completely accurate and the next sentence to be completely false. We should look at historical sources with a consistent criteria, Christian, Jewish, Roman, Greek, etc. Are they early? Are, do they ha are they reliable? Do they match up with other external sources? Exactly. Historians want to match up claims in one source with external sources. That's why I care what we can find outside the Bible, Frank. To compare. To confirm. Whenever I say, for the Bible tells me so, I'm always referring to a discrete claim presented in the Bible that doesn't correspond to any external source, or often an eternal source. And that doesn't mean the claim is automatically false. It's just affirmation that the particular claim 
isn't corroborated. I can't print this, Lois. You might have hallucinated half of it. What about the civilian contractors who corroborated my story? As someone who doesn't necessarily take the Bible as evidence of the claim, but as claims. I've still come to accept the general scholarly consensus that Paul wrote seven of his letters, but I don't accept the entire New Testament. When it comes to the Gospels and Acts in particular, I feel about those the same way Sean feels about later Gospels that didn't make it into the biblical canon. I'm not even sure we can know at all what history is or where legend begins. Sean draws an arbitrary line that legendary details arose only after the Gospel of John, where I contend that legendary development would have begun immediately from the first days. And so, Frank, I want to know what can be confirmed outside the Bible in order to better assess what it says inside the Bible. Something Sean affirms to be a good mark of historical methodology. For someone like me, when I was coming out of my Christianity, I really took this whole idea of no one would die for something that they know is a lie to be a very serious challenge uh, that didn't have to come from the Bible. I thought that was really good external evidence. Say what one might about the accuracy of the scriptures. I don't need the Bible to demonstrate that the church exists. I can't explain it away. And since it exists, the church obviously had initial members who started the movement. Now I was told growing up as a Christian or reading certain Christian apologists who had overstated the case and given the impression that we know with confidence that all the apostles except maybe John died as martyrs for their beliefs, refusing to recant up to the point of death. But in the more skeptical quest I later undertook, I had to ask, Give me evidence any of them died for it. And the students kind of look at me and I'm thinking, huh, I don't think I have as good of a response to this as I should have, given that I've used this argument in the past. Like Sean, I started to examine this claim. And the evidence for it simply didn't match up. So understandably, when he starts to examine it and doesn't match up with it was told, he's disappointed. I had one pastor in my research, he said, man, you're gonna make a liar out of all of us. And I said, man, that is not my intention. But I think we've oversold this argument. It creates people like me when you set an expectation that we know the grizzly deaths and that, you know, that, th and that we can hang our hat on those. And I, I applaud you for challenging Christians to not overstate their evidence. And this is a point I agree with them, that a lot of Christians and apologists need to stop overstating the evidence for the apostles. He went out of his way to make that. And I don't remember if I used the word amen or not, but at least inside I was thinking, amen, that's right. I think there's also been a hyper trust by many Christians who read fathers and says, hey, they all died as martyrs, and they proclaim it. Well, I've made that claim in the past, so I repent on this show from making that before I did my research. That should be corrected as well. Let's be careful. Let's have more mm -hmm. integrity here. Let's not overstate the case. So that was a wonderful common ground that he and I le left with agreeing together. Okay, since Sean and I agree on what case cannot be made, what is Sean's take? Yeah, so I'm very careful how I word this. Mm -hmm. I don't say in the book and I don't say in any of my talks or debates that the death of the apostles proves Christianity, mm -hmm. nor does it prove the resurrection. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. The willingness of the apostles to suffer and die for their belief that Jesus had risen from the grave shows that they're not making this up, but they sincerely believed these claims. All it shows is they're not liars. It counters the idea that they invented this story, that they made it up, they're lying, that it's conspiracy to get some kind of gain out of it. That's my only but, point. So Sean's only point is to combat a hypothesis that the resurrection is an entirely deliberately fabricated lie. For this purpose, a mere one or two sincere witnesses achieves this modest goal. However, what I put forth is entirely different. He thinks there's a better explanation for the origin of the Christian faith than them actually seeing the risen Jesus. Exactly. Specifically, I contend that whatever actual resurrection eyewitnesses we have, they were sincere. Everyone who claimed to be an eyewitness was very sincere, which is actually, I can kind of get there. You kind of got me there, that everyone who was the eyewitness was sincere. Sincere, but sincerely mistaken. Here's Sean's carefully worded statement again, but I think it's a little imprecise. My strong concern over this ambiguity took some strange turns in our conversation, which I'll get to, but I'm going to try different tack today and hopefully make further progress by starting with Sean's position rather than mine. My concern is the word apostles. This label means different things to different people in different contexts. The author of Luke used it differently than Paul. 
who used it differently than church fathers, who used it differently than modern lay people. Even Jesus is called an apostle in Hebrews. There must be some other word we can use to more precisely identify the characteristics of the people we want to consider. You might be thinking, wait a minute, what about all the other people throughout history who've been willing to die for their beliefs? In fact, what about modern day Muslim terrorists who die for their faith? Does that mean Islam is true? Yet here's an important distinction to keep in mind. They weren't eyewitnesses of Muhammad doing miracles. Yes, thank you. Sean identifies the most important distinction to be eyewitnesses. Whether they claim to be eyewitnesses, that's actually the part I really care the most about. In fact, when my initial video suggested that only eyewitnesses should be included, Sean agreed with me. If you look at the beginning of Acts, when the apostles are searching for a replacement for Judas, they have two criteria. One of the criteria is that this replacement had been with Jesus during his public ministry, and second, that this replacement had seen the risen Jesus. So the first criteria that Paul G. lays out, that the person claimed to have witnessed the risen Jesus, is an important one and a point of agreement between us. The apostles lived with Jesus. They traveled with Jesus. They said they had seen the risen Jesus. So the truth of the proclamation that we have is tied to their claim that they saw the risen Jesus. That's why it's qualitatively different. With this affirmation, I feel quite safe in swapping out the phrase willingness of the apostles with willingness of the eyewitnesses of resurrected Jesus. And in doing so that I've maintained the spirit of Sean's argument. Next, I will let Sean tell us which apostles by his own criteria, that he accepts were eyewitnesses of resurrected Jesus willing to suffer and die. And then I started looking at the evidence for the different apostles and assessing them as objectively as I could. I would argue that of the 12, there's only two that we have very high confidence died, historically speaking. And that's Peter and James, a brother of, uh, of John, James son of Zebedee. Mm -hmm. And I would say outside of the 12, James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul, we also have very high confidence. Those are the only four I think we can put in first century consistent early documents. Now, on some level, more probable than not, I might put Andrew and Thomas, but the sources are less and they're a little late. And the rest are just, I think, inconclusive. I'm not even sure we can know at all what history is or where legend begins. And we have really good evidence for four, probably decent evidence for two, and the rest, we're not sure. That's right. At the end of the day, Sean has four yeses, and two maybes. For the sake of time, I trust you've seen enough of our respective skepticism levels to know that what Sean calls probably, I'm going to call probably not. You don't just dismiss out of hand the, the accounts. You're willing to look at the historically. You obviously come at it. You, you, your level of skepticism, let's say, is, is ratcheted a bit higher. I'm with Sean. I just lower everything. So when he says as plausible as not, I say not plausible. He has um, as probable as not. I just lower that down to, like, these likely didn't happen. So Peter, Paul, James, son of Zebedee, and James, the brother of Jesus, are the four that we should check against Sean's crafted position. If you follow my videos, you may know that I concede that there is sufficient historical evidence for me to accept that both Peter and Paul claim to be eyewitnesses and died for this belief. And Paul's like, we know they exist. Let's not waste our time there. In fact, I even concede Peter and Paul. I was pleasantly surprised. Yep. But before we move on to evaluate the Jameses, we need to take a quick sidetrack. In Sean's first response, he brought in a trope about crime from his friend J. Warner Wallace, the cold case detective. In all of his cases, People are motivated by one of three things. Criminals are motivated by either power, money and greed, or sex. Power, money, or sex. And put forth the notion that the disciples of Jesus must have been honest fellows because they weren't motivated by any of these. For some reason that must have seemed like a good idea at the time, I decided to derail our martyr conversation to tackle this point. It doesn't take bikini model sex, billionaire wealth, or dictator level power to motivate someone. The smallest taste of those things can motivate. Why wouldn't a bunch of fishermen prefer to earn a less smelly living by preaching from town to town? When I was in church ministry, when I was in youth ministry, I saw over and over, it only takes the smallest piece of power for people to lust after that power. So you put someone in charge of the big table, 
bake sale table, that person is all in on the power of that, that bake sale <laughs> table. That's a very interesting point. And one, one I hadn't particularly considered, but, but in a sense, the, the, as you say, they went from relative obscurity to at least within the Christian community being very significant figures. So Paul just told a story about how people can be motivated by power. This was an assertion without any evidence that this is actually what motivated Peter and Paul, by the way. That's exactly how I feel when you say things like, James son of Alphaeus was, was definitely killed because of Jesus, when really the text does not say that. It looks like we both have a problem with the other party straying beyond actual evidence into the land of speculation and assertion. And so when I pushed back on him in the discussion, he said, well, maybe this happened. And I pushed back and I said, you're just telling a story. <laughs> you're literally telling a story. That's an assertion. That's not evidence. And he said he felt the same about me. To clear, I think we're going to need a new song for this one. Here's the story. Okay, now we're ready to talk about some Jameses. James, the son of Zebedee. We have high or very high probability they died, historically speaking. Now, Sean uses this highest possible confidence because the death is recorded in the book of Acts, which is part of the Bible which Sean obviously holds as the source with the highest possible authority. I think we have solid evidence that James died. Now, it's only one source. Even if we take Acts as reliable in this case, it's a single sentence. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. There's not much here to tell us what James was up to, nor why Herod put him to death. James is preaching a message. Oh, was he? The skeptic you were debating, Paul, and said... Well, we don't know if James, son of Zebedee, was killed because he was preaching. That's an uncanny impression of me. So it, it's a fair question yeah. to say, you know, I mean, if, if James, if somebody robbed his house and killed him, would he qualify as a martyr? Yeah, right. And of course not. So I think it's great right. that he's asking this question. This account does not report what Herod believed about James during this time. Is that going to stop you from speculating about Herod's motivations? There was political motivation for this. I think you're right about that, Paul. And it pleased uh, the religious leaders at the time. So he hasn't beheaded for political reasons. But why pick James? Because James was one of the outspoken leaders of this Christian movement. Right. Had James not been preaching the risen Jesus, had he not been a leader in the apostolic movement, had he left this movement and held different beliefs, he would not have been executed by Herod at this time. So yes, he was put to death for political reasons, but it's not just solely political reasons. Here's the story. The text does not say that. The text says that, that he was killed, put to death by the sword. And then you present this whole story of how, well, obviously he was going around preaching and obviously he was going around doing this. That's not obvious to me. It's not recorded. Uh, it's an inference. Is that an inference of a kind? Sure. But that's not a blind inference. The very, very scant information we have for James, son of Zebedee, after the death of Jesus is one verse in chapter one and one verse in chapter 12 of the book of Acts. This is the source we're attempting to affirm, but nothing else inside or outside of the Bible can affirm it. At no point do we have James putting himself forth as an eyewitness. At no point do we know if James was preaching anything at all. What we do have is Sean spinning a tale far beyond what the text provides. But Sean's are not the only inferences that could be drawn. The early Christian arrests were for disturbing the peace not theology. In Mark 3.17, Jesus gave James the nickname Son of Thunder. In Luke 9, when a particular Samaritan village isn't lavishly hospitable to Jesus, James asks, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? James, son of Zebedee, was a bit of a hothead. Makes sense that a troublemaker with a temper might run afoul of the governor and get himself killed. It's an inference of a kind, sure, but that's not a blind inference. A very important point, which is, you know, to establish that they may well have died and, and been killed, you know, by someone who wanted them dead. But was it directly in response to the message that they were preaching or, or the, the faith that they held? Take again, James, a brother of Jesus. Paul G wants to say that the death of James was political murder, not ideological. The death of James, uh, the brother of Jesus, was specifically called by Josephus a political death. Yes, G James was politically murdered, but we cannot separate that from the ideology that he taught and lived. Here's the story. We simply don't know what they were preaching. We don't know what they were doing. So not only do we not know whether they died, but I, 
I can't go with you that extra mile and say we know what they were saying. Once again, Sean is making inferences that go beyond what the texts actually say. Our conversation about James the brother of Jesus mainly reiterates our positions from the prior videos, so check those to see if either of our story extrapolations are convincing to you. But in fairness, I want to allow Sean one of his stronger points against my rejection of James' status as an eyewitness. So the early, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which I heard in one of your discussions, Paul, you can see it is probably five years uh, from the time itself of, say, the death of Jesus. Five-year window, we had this creed and the claim that Jesus appeared to James in particular. Now, precisely because this portion of Corinthians is Paul quoting an earlier tradition, I consider it to be part of the legendary development in the oral tradition that happened in the decades before Paul wrote. Scholars agree that Paul is passing along a memorized recitation here, not something he could personally attest to. The rub may lie, however, in Paul having met James once. So, for your consideration. But more importantly to me, when we're talking about, for example, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, we don't have anywhere where James says, hey, I'm James, the brother of Jesus, and I saw a resurrected Jesus. Those are, for me, secondhand hearsay accounts. The only way to do history and know if somebody was a witness of something is not for them to directly say, I saw this personally in the way Paul does and maybe Peter does. But a firsthand report is obviously the best way. It's necessarily better than secondhand, thirdhand, and well beyond. Sure, one could settle for unverifiable hearsay, but I see no reason to. And I'm pleased that Sean agrees that among all of the apostles he studied, only Paul calls himself an eyewitness. So if we're only going to accept a claim that we have in somebody's own words saying, I saw A, B, or C, we're going to toss out a ton of stuff that we know about history. That's my, okay, let's toss out a ton of stuff we know about history face. This tact of advocating for a single evidential standard across every historical claim is frustrating. Sean doesn't accept Muhammad flying on a horse as historical, but if he consistently accepted hearsay across the board, he'd have to. I think it's reasonable to want eyewitness testimony to come from the eyewitness. It's not up to me to lower these standards just to meet the stories available. And so we end the way we began, affirming only two sincere eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus, Peter and Paul. Minimally, I'm saying, fine, we have two people who really believe they saw Jesus. Two of the key spokespeople for the Christian faith who proclaim, teach theology, write books in the scripture. That's pretty significant. But that's actually the heart of my naturalistic explanation for this whole thing is that we have two people who, for whatever reason, came to believe this and deciding that Peter early on. Maybe he had a bereavement experience. He was sad. And so he saw Jesus to get over his grief. And Paul later on, after he was persecuting people and probably felt really guilty about that. And Paul very much describes what he saw as a vision. I don't think that's the best explanation, but I'd be willing to concede Okay, that like th that's possible. In my hypothesis, what it came down to is we really can be confident about two guys. They're the ones who are prominent. And if they were sincere, which I've now come to believe those two were probably sincere. Then then we don't really have to go into crazy explanations about group hallucinations or group appearances and all those kind of things. Those don't have to come into play anymore. We just have to explain how two people came to sincerely believe something. That doesn't count for the empty tomb. Well, I don't think there ever was an empty tomb. So perhaps another topic for another day. What was the main thrust of Paul's argument throughout the entire debate? He doesn't trust the appearance claims to the rest of the apostles. That's a part of his critique. He only accepts Peter and Paul. And therefore, if we just have Peter and Paul, he thinks there's a better explanation for the origin of the Christian faith than them actually seeing the risen Jesus. Yes. Exactly. It seems to me, though, that your your point as, you know, as a skeptic is to say, well, but on the basis of two people having this belief that they were willing to die for, is that enough realistically to, to, to not posit a more likely thing that they, you know, had some bad pizza or whatever the equivalent right. example is for them, that, that they just misinterpreted something? Yes. Awesome. While they presumably haven't suddenly changed their mind on this resurrection thing, it seems that both of the Christians in this conversation came away with a clear understanding of my point and my position. What more could I ask for in such a situation? Well, that's the main topic in a nutshell. But with so much discussion going on, 
there were bound to be sexy side topics to flare up and rabbit trails to follow. Let's start with the issue that seems to have most captured the imagination of the Christian show hosts, the relationship between the Book of Acts and the Jewish historian Josephus. It almost seemed like the gentleman you were debating the other day on Unbelievable was saying, I can't trust Acts because Acts is just copied from Josephus or, you know, some crazy story yeah. like that. You know, some crazy story. As dedicated as Frank clearly is to accurate depictions, let's go ahead and take a look at what was actually said when Sean was making a defense of the general historicity of the biblical book of Acts. When we look at Acts, we compare it to what we know with Josephus and independently with the writings of Paul, we see a remarkable matchup between them. According to Sean, Acts lines up with the secular historian Josephus, and Acts lines up with the letters of Paul. As I've said all along, I'm looking for corroboration of the Bible claims. Now you'll recall from earlier in the video that I accept seven of the letters of Paul to be authentic. So if Sean is right, this should be a very compelling argument to me. However, one of my primary reasons for being skeptical of Acts is that but I really don't think that Acts and the Pauline letters line up very well at all. What I see to be the remarkable differences, rather than remarkable similarities, between Paul's letters and the book of Acts are enough to fill an entire video, or even a series of videos for me one day. But in the scope of this conversation, I merely wanted to put on record my high-level counter to Sean's point. And since Sean mentioned two external sources he feels corroborate Acts, the completest in me was compelled to address the second as well. The people who work at secular colleges who aren't bound by, you know, that the Bible is true and inerrant. This is a little dig from me. Sean works at Biola University. And like most evangelical Christian universities, everyone on staff is required to conform their personal, professional, and academic work to a statement of faith. For anyone to work at Biola, they must affirm that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are without error or misstatement in their moral and spiritual teaching and record of historical facts. They are without error or defect of any kind. Now, while it would not follow that an academic who signs such an affirmation is therefore wrong about any arrived conclusion, it certainly does follow that such an academic was not free to arrive at an alternate conclusion. Since far more New Testament study is happening under such statements of faith than under academic freedom, I was clumsily attempting to clarify the scope of the opinions I was about to characterize. We know that the author of Luke Acts used many sources. They actually, most of them think that Josephus was one of the sources that he used in his book. So it doesn't surprise anyone that Josephus uh, occasionally lines up with Luke when we, when we feel that that's one of the sources that he used. Now, I'll confess that even in the context of narrowing it down to scholars with full academic freedom, I overstated my case to say that most of them think that Josephus served as a source for Acts. I haven't done the kind of survey necessary to make such a proclamation. We'll talk more about this momentarily, but suffice to say that in the moment, this is a view common enough for Sean to be aware of and to have considered. It's not a solid case that Acts just borrows Josephus. We see overlap, but when they overlap, things are described very differently. Some stuff is included, some stuff is left out. It doesn't have the marks of somebody who's just copying another document. While at the time, I failed to specify the relative weight upon which I place this Josephus source hypothesis, I'll clarify now that I take it as an interesting possibility rather than a scholarly certainty. I would certainly not have brought it up at all if Sean hadn't already drawn the connection as part of his case. But this was clearly something that stood out for Sean as he reflected on our conversation. So what I should have done at that moment, I always think of the moment after, I was like, oh, oh so do I, especially when I'm debating my wife. Now, one point I would say is, okay, let me just concede to you that Luke borrows Josephus. Mm -hmm. So when he says he's citing these other accounts, doesn't that tell us we can trust him to use good, reliable sources. So, ironically, that point actually works in my favor. That someone uses one reliable source tells us nothing about the reliability of their other sources. For example, I have used Sean's book as a major source in all of my videos about the fates of the apostles. I'm pretty sure that Sean considers his own book to be an excellent source of information. But at the same time, I also use sources who claim that the author of Acts used Josephus as a source. We know that Sean is critical of these sources, 
Yet by his logic, they should be considered equally reliable as his book, simply because Polygia referenced them both. And, by extension, that all of the conclusions of all of my videos should be considered reliable because I use Sean's book, which is reliable. Obviously, this does not follow, as Sean goes on to critique. I've just been reading the new commentary on Acts by Keener that comes out, that's out with Cambridge Press. He says, almost all scholars date Acts between 70 to 90, most within the 80s. Mm -hmm. So it's a minority of scholars in the 90s. But if Josephus is written in the 90s, of those few who date Acts in the 90s, it's still a very smaller fringe group who would say that Acts uses Josephus. Sean really wants to label the Josephus as an Acts source view as fringe. So much so, Sean brought it up in his interview last week with Craig Keener, the author of the commentary he referenced. But I'm pretty sure that's a really fringe position. How many people accept scholarly, do they have good reasons to think the book of Acts was borrowed from Josephus? In terms of how many, it, it depends. As of a few years ago, when Richard Pervo, who, who holds a second century date for Acts, when he wrote about um, summarizing the different positions, between 60, well, no, between 70 and 90 was the majority position. Uh, mm -hmm. The 60s was the second leading position. Okay. The 90s was the third leading, and the second century was the smallest. Now, since that time, the second century has grown um, not sure if that's been more at the expense of the 90s or which, but um, the majority of scholars still date Acts too early to be dependent on Josephus. So by the words of Sean's own favorite expert, the most recent shift and trend is in the direction of the position I put forth, even though Keener himself doesn't agree. When asked directly, Keener did not affirm Sean's adjective of fringe. In scholarship, as they both know, Minority opinion isn't the same as fringe opinion. Okay, and some things I speak with scholarly consensus. On this one, I'm speaking just, um, this is me. Okay. And as discussed, taking a vote in New Testament studies is problematic on its face when a significant portion of those who fall under this broad umbrella do not enjoy academic freedom. Now, why does this even matter to Sean? For that, we need to make one more stop along the way. When Sean was pitching me that when it comes to martyrdom, suffering can be just as good as death, he said, So the academic literature as a whole considers that clause as constituting a martyr. And as his example citation, Thomas Westpedal wrote his dissertation on this at Trinity Evangelical Seminary in 2005. Trinity Evangelical Seminary. And so I made this anecdotal observation. You know, the academia you list tends to be evangelical academia, to which Sean later protested. I actually don't just rely upon evangelical scholars. Right. I said the academia you list tends to be evangelical, not exclusively evangelical. So it's just false to say that critique that I'm only using fringe scholarship. Wait, what? I didn't say only. And I definitely didn't call anything fringe. And I think even just categorizing somebody as evangelical, therefore they're fringe, I think is uncharitable too. And he didn't use that word. He just kind of dismissed it and said, you're only relying upon evangelical scholarship. Well, I didn't say only evangelical. And it seems we're all agreed that I didn't call anyone fringe. And he didn't use that word. Help me out here, Cameron. I think that he might respond to that by saying he's not objecting to it because it's fringe. It's, he's objecting to it because these scholars are biased, because they're Christian evangelical scholars. Yes, exactly. I acknowledge that evangelicals make up a huge portion of those actively publishing about the New Testament. So evangelical and fringe could never really be synonymous in such circles. They've got the numbers. But as I've pointed out, for better or worse, the skeptic in me tends to be suspicious of people who have signed a statement promising a predetermined conclusion before they do their research. I would never dismiss such a person or their research out of hand, but it seems reasonable to approach their work with more caution than those with full academic freedom. So, to sum up, at no point did I label anything fringe. He didn't use that word. And at all times, I've consistently expressed preference for scholars with academic freedom. So here's why this is important, because Paul critiqued me in saying you can't trust Acts because he borrows from Josephus. No, I said that places of alignment between Acts and Josephus might possibly indicate a borrowing of material 
rather than necessarily indicating independent attestation. Which puts him using fringe scholarship. By your label, second century dating of Acts seems to be gaining legitimacy among those with academic freedom. But when we came back at the very beginning and I defined a martyr and pointed towards an evangelical scholar, he dismissed it because he thinks that an evangelical scholar is a fringe scholarship. No, I observed a tendency toward evangelical scholarship, which, as I've indicated, I treat with some initial caution due to predetermined outcomes. Not dismissal, but caution. So, on one case, he dismisses a quote-unquote fringe scholar because it doesn't make his case. I didn't call it fringe, and I don't dismiss. So, I didn't think of that later, but that's one of the things that I think he does is a little bit of a hyper-skepticism to this issue, and I'm just calling for consistency. I do give greater benefit of the doubt to scholarship with academic freedom. For better or worse... I feel like I've been incredibly consistent on this point, including Sean's two examples. Am I wrong? And speaking of hyperskepticism, before our discussion, Sean found something I said in my very first live debate. You said, what would convince me? Quote, the requirement of evidence is so high. If I saw an appearance of Jesus, I would first question my mental faculties. I would question, what, question whether this vision was really real. And I read that, I thought, okay, he is coming from a hyper-skeptical position, and you're free to do that. But that's not how scholarship operates. When you talk to me about being hyper-skeptical, if I saw Jesus in front of me, like that's either a miracle or I'm seeing something. Like Those are the two options. So it only makes sense to me. I can't imagine, you know, Sean, if someone from your congregation came and said, you know, I saw Jesus appear to me last night, you would probably at least in your head say, well, perhaps this was something you imagined. And perhaps it was real. You'd at least put both of those options on the table. Yeah. So I don't think it's hyper skeptical to at least want to go through the mental exercise of saying, did I have bad pizza? Did I like, are there factors? Am I overtired? Like, are there factors that may have contributed? Okay. So that's, like a, that's fair. And look, I'm actually naturally a skeptic. I question things. If someone comes to me and says, Hey, I saw a miracle in Jesus. I'm like, yeah, give me some evidence. Mm -hmm. So I'm skeptical like that. So we agree. I am not in some fringe of weirdness that, uh, you know, is beyond this, but you know, historical Wait, you are a cartoon character online. I mean, you got to admit, <laughs> this is true. That, that contributes a little bit to it. Come on, uh, Paul. <laughs> you might be thinking, hey, are we ever going to talk about martyrdom in this discussion about martyrs? First of all, maybe we need to define a few terms. I mean, maybe the term martyr is a good place to start. And I'll start with you, Paul, on this one. Now, I don't have any intrinsic interest in martyrdom in general. My interest is entirely limited to how martyrdom intersects with the truth of Jesus' resurrection. So I set the scope. Well, for me, when we're talking about martyrs, when I'm, I'm looking back at someone who's able to, their witness is supposed to be a guarantor of the resurrection. And my now familiar criteria. There's three things that I'm looking for when I'm looking for martyr. First is that the person claimed to be an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus. Second, that the person had a chance to save their life by uh, recanting. And then third, that rather than recant, that they chose not to die. Paul, one of the things I appreciate about your response is that you laid out your three criteria, and then you tested the evidence based on that three criteria. In other words, you have a systematic methodology, and it doesn't meet the criteria, so you dismiss the argument. I wish, right. more, wish more Christians and skeptics would approach <laughs> any issue this way, which makes our methodology clear. But it also won't surprise you that I differ pretty strongly with the methodology. So Sean went through his thoughts on each of my criteria. So let's come back to the first one about them saying they saw the resurrected Jesus. Okay, so not the first one. And the one piece I think that Sean missed in the response he did for me is that uh, the person claimed to be an eyewitness. And we don't have very many people who claim to be eyewitnesses. The first thing I need to do is first even, did they witness anything? Right. And then move on to the, this whole death thing. The only way to do history and know if somebody was a witness of something is not for them to directly say, I saw this personally in the way Paul does, and maybe Peter does. I agree. There are endless ways to lower one's standards, accepting unknown levels of anonymous hearsay. We don't have Bartholomew saying, Jesus appeared to me. And I'd say, that's fine. But that is way too skeptical of a history. And I might think... And you might think I have a hyper-trusting approach to this. That's fine. Let's take criteria two and three. So criteria two, you said, was that they had a chance to save their lives by recanting. And three, rather than recant, they choose to die. 
Now, Paul G. is right that the apostles, at least we don't have a record of the apostles, being told that if they recant their beliefs, they will be able to survive. The reality is we don't have any good early sources of, the, of say, Nero or his cohorts saying to Peter, hey, we won't kill you if you recant. We don't have that for Paul. We don't have that for James or John, mm -hmm. any of them. Mm -hmm. If you begin with that assumption and then look at the historical record, you're going to dismiss, as Paul Gia does, much of it. So Sean concedes that the historical sources can't meet my criteria. So because he starts with this definition and then uh, funnels everything through it, he ends up dismissing almost all of the rest of the apostles outside of Peter and Paul. And I say if we expand that definition a little bit in line with how it's often used in academia and popular circles, I think we'd come to a very different conclusion. And Sean proceeded to spend significant time providing other definitions for the word martyr. I don't think it passes muster on a scholarly academic level, and I don't think it does on a popular level for people who think about this as well. And let me explain why. So okay. I had to read all this martyrological research to define what a martyr is. Mm -hmm. And I realized there's a lot more extensive research here than ever crossed my mind. And there's a huge history in the church and beyond about what is a martyr and how do you qualify a martyr. Many scholars would agree that the apostles still could and would qualify as martyrs. They're publicly proclaiming a message, knowing what it could potentially cost them, could have walked away from this message at any point. So if they're killed in a way tied to their religious practice, they could be considered a martyr. And brought in an example of a French priest. And popularly in 2016, there was this French priest by the name of Jacques Hamel. And I apologize to French listeners if I butcher that. And he was actually giving communion. And in the middle of giving communion, uh, some radical Muslims walked in and slit his throat and killed him. But Muslims, Christians, the press, the president of France, everybody refers to him as a martyr because he died while actively living out his faith, even though he didn't have a chance to recant. He didn't have a chance to recant. But nor can we reasonably expect that any priest in the Western world has any realistic expectation that they're putting themselves in imminent danger for talking about Jesus. This isn't a willingness to suffer. And why would word usage by a politician or reporters in a wholly different time, circumstance, and context have any bearing on the word usage in my context? Let's suppose Sean and I were having a conversation about Christians. And I asked Sean what he means when he says Christian. Sean replies that, to him, a Christian is someone who believes and follows Jesus Christ. And I said, Sean, that's great. But did you know that Christian might also mean anyone who just says they're a Christian? Or anyone who was raised in a Christian environment? Or maybe just anyone who lives in the Western Hemisphere? Sean would be right to say, that's fine, Paul. Call them Christians if you want. But I'm not here to talk about everyone who lives in the Western Hemisphere. I'm here to talk about people who follow Jesus Christ. This is how I felt. If Sean wants to define martyr as anything other than an eyewitness to resurrected Jesus who died defending that claim, then we're simply no longer talking about the same thing. He laid out three criteria, and I responded to two of them, and almost felt like he said, okay, I can see those two, let's talk about the first. And I should have said, okay, time out. This is your whole project here. You just conceded two of the three. No, I didn't concede two of the three. I recognized that we were in a pointless definition fight over a word that I don't care about intrinsically. Of all the conversations on the internet, I think definitional debates are the least useful and the least interesting. Define martyr is someone who suffers for their beliefs. Define martyr is someone willing to suffer. Define martyr is someone expressing an unpopular opinion. Define martyr is someone who goes to the mall and hears happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas. These may well all be acceptable usages. But they are usages that no longer relate to evidence for the resurrection of Jesus and are no longer related to how I use the word. If in these conversations I need to stop using the word martyr, that's fine. I'll use pethopatoni, which is mashing together the Greek for I died seeing Jesus. Martyr is actually the Greek word for eyewitness, so that would have been a good one to keep. Oh well. Pethapatani means someone who says they saw resurrected Jesus and died defending that belief. Let's talk about them. Strangely, it turns out, Sean didn't care about the word martyr either. But to be honest, Frank, when it's all said and done, uh, pun intended, I don't want to die on the definition of martyr. Right. That's really not what's most important. 
whether or not Paul and I can differ over the technical term of martyr for this in a sense is really secondary. For my case, it doesn't even matter that any of them died actually as martyrs, however we define a martyr. I had this conversation with William Lane Craig and he agreed with me and said, we don't have to prove any of them died as martyrs, whether it's your definition or whether it's mine. Listen, I'm going to put this one on me. I should have engaged more specifically with Sean on whether willingness to suffer shows just as much dedication to a cause as crossing the point of actual death and what difference a recant opportunity makes. I was guilty of being impatient, disinterested in a definition war, and more interested in talking about his top four guys, all of whom die in reasonably documented ways. So this felt like a side issue. If Sean and I ever get a chance to talk again, I'll suggest we don't use the word martyr at all, and just engage with these core concepts by name. And speaking of definitional fights... If the 1997-98 Bulls, somebody says, hey, Jordan and the Bulls, uh, they're late for a game. Does that mean we can't really conclude that Scottie Pippen was late because he's not mentioned? We don't know about Steve Kerr. We don't know about Horace Grant, fill in the blank, whoever that may be. We actually know who that group was. Okay. So one of the things that Paul would argue is that we only have good reason to believe that Jesus appeared to Peter and to Paul, and he doesn't list the apostles by name. Therefore, their willingness to suffer and or die or martyrdoms doesn't matter because we don't know who the 12 are. Well, I think I can understand why Sean came away with this impression, and that's probably my fault for not making it more clear in my objections. I wouldn't argue that at all. I think that whenever the New Testament talks about the 12, we can be clear on who that means, even in the Creed in 1 Corinthians 15, which would be the most relevant passage to our discussion. But I do very much have a general objection to throwing around the word apostles in these discussions because it's imprecise. Different people use the word in different ways. For example, when Paul uses the word apostles itself, it can mean a broader group. Mm -hmm. But Luke, when he uses the term apostles, almost always refers distinctly to the 12. Which I would grant. And if this topic of conversation could stick exclusively to Luke Acts, then fine. But Paul uses the term more loosely than the author of Luke does. And the oft-quoted early church fathers use the term even more loosely than Paul does. In the broadest definition, apostle simply means someone sent out by Jesus. When modern-day Christians use the term, who knows who they mean within a given sentence? My objection to the imprecision of the word apostles is in sentences like this. The willingness of the apostles to suffer and die for their belief that Jesus had risen from the grave shows that they're not making this up. Who does Sean mean when he says apostles? If you've watched this far in the video, you know he means two of the twelve, Peter and James son of Zebedee, and two outside the twelve, Paul and James brother Jesus, and maybe two others. He means somewhere between four to six guys. But by using this blanket term apostles, Sean's listeners may come away thinking there's 12, 14, or maybe even a larger number lumping in more of those first century church fathers. I think this imprecision helps feed some of the overstating of the case that Sean advocates against. If I wanted to relate this to Sean's Chicago Bulls analogy, I'd have to agree that depending on context, the Bulls are late can infer a specific group of players being actively waited upon. And even clarifying the 97-98 Chicago Bulls gives me high confidence. But Sean might remember that Scottie Pippen was actually out with a foot injury for the first half of the 97-98 season, and not traveling with the team. So Sean would have to clarify when in the season the Bulls were late, in order for anyone to actually know if Pippen was part of the crew who were late. He's over-assuming to say that the 97-98 Bulls references always included Pippen. At O'Hare Airport, I once heard someone yell, I love the Bulls! Now, which players should I suppose he meant? The current roster? The 97-98 roster? Some select favorites over time? It's not clear. According to this headline from last week, the Chicago Bulls are in a market for a new director of player development. Does that mean Scottie Pippen is looking for a new director of player development? Or would I need to use context to infer who is meant by the imprecise label Chicago Bulls? In this case, it doesn't mean any of the players at all. What about people 2,000 years from now, reading reports from the 21st century about the Bulls? Will they automatically know which players are meant in all contexts? Or will they need to question and dig and, in some cases, debate the usage? 
Just like the bulls, sometimes context tells us who are meant by the term apostles, and sometimes the context leaves it ambiguous. And so, it's an ambiguous label. <sighs> I've been going for a while, and there are so many other points I wanted to cover. We don't have to assume all of Acts, all John, all the Gospels are true. We ask, is a claim, an event, or a saying multiply attested in different genres and in different books? And when it comes to the appearances of Jesus, that's exactly what we find. No, even if we take the Gospels and Acts at their word, none of the post-resurrection appearances are multiply attested. Unlike most Jesus stories, each incident of an appearance is recorded in only one place in the Bible, singly attested. Now, some skeptics will dismiss the story and say it's been made up because it's, it's invented to look like Jesus. Now, I don't buy that. But I said to Paul, I said, fine, I'll give you that argument. He didn't grab that to me, and I've never made that argument. I just assume Sean might be thinking of some other skeptic here. He does talk to a lot of them. We can't just ask what's possible. You have to have any theory that is going to explain all the facts as we know them. I have a theory that explains all the facts. It's just that you and I don't yet agree on what those facts are. First steps first. I think he's bringing a certain worldview to the table that dismisses the supernatural before we look at the evidence. I'm open to the supernatural, though I do give it a low prior probability. Remember, I first came to serious study of the resurrection evidence fully believing that Jesus rose from the dead. I was all on board for the supernatural in all its forms. But, but yeah, but you still think that's a more likely scenario ultimately than the miraculous one. It was the lack of evidence that turned me away. I think our stories just illustrate common research into this question, and you lean more towards the skeptical side, not convinced by it. I've said, yeah, there's been an overstatement here, but if we pull this back, like you said, this doesn't prove the resurrection is true. I can't convince myself that they made this up or that this is a conspiracy, or that they're lying about this. Fair enough. My thanks to Paul Gia for making his video very entertaining, and you've certainly made me think. And thank you, Sean, for all this engagement with a mere YouTuber like me. You're a man of class and integrity, and I hope there are opportunities for us to have more conversations in the future. It's time for me to sign off and say thank you very much, Paul or Paul Ogia, uh, on YouTube, and uh, Sean McDowell, thanks both for being with me today on the show. And thank you for watching. For more of our interactions, Tap on the Apologia vs. Sean McDowell playlist on the screen now. Your YouTube channel is bigger than the church was for decades. Until next time, later.